So I'd like to take this moment on behalf of Dianova to express our gratitude to the NGO CSW Committee on the Status of Women in New York for their tireless and continued work to make this NGO CSW 65 forum possible. I'd also like to thank our partners in this event, Intercambios Asociación Civil, the NGO, New York NGO Committee on Drugs and ODC House Louisiana for being with us here today, in some cases with very short notice. According to recent UN Women data, one in three women globally experience physical or sexual violence, mostly by an intimate partner. Since the pandemic, violence against women, especially domestic violence, has intensified. In words of Antonio Guterres, Secretary General of the United Nations, violence against women is a shadow pandemic. After depression, addiction represents the most frequent condition among victims of violence. In recent decades, several studies have shown how closely addictive behavior and gender violence are related. In today's event, on the topic addressing gender-based violence, a key element in gender-sensitive addiction treatment programs, we will explore the relation between gender-based violence and drug use and the need to design and implement gender-sensitive addiction treatment programs. We will learn how to these programs help women deal with trauma and violence and develop coping skills and life skills to move forward in recovery. Women that use drugs also face historical and cultural barriers, and we will be provided with specific examples from Argentina and the United States. Finally, the role of civil society at the international level, specifically in relation to the United Nations, the su successful working methods, the opportunities and the challenges will be a part of the discussion. After the presentations of our four speakers, there will be a time for Q&A from the audience. Questions to the speakers are most welcome and can be posted in the chat box. Without further ado then, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Gisela Hansen of Dianova. Gisela Hansen is doctor in clinical psychology with extensive experience in drug treatment and intervention in therapeutic communities. Her areas of expertise include gender, stigma, and childhood approach in the field of addictions. Gisela is a member of the board of directors of the Catalan Federation of Drug Addiction and a member of the Riot Working Group on Gender and Stigma. She's also a professor at the University of Barcelona Gisela frequently participates in civil society forums at the United Nations to advocate the need to implement a gender approach in addiction treatment programs. In her role at Dianova, Spain, Gisela is responsible for the therapeutic coordination of addiction treatment programs. Gisela, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Maria Victoria. Good afternoon, good morning, everyone, wherever you are. I'm so glad to be here. Thank you for inviting me. It's a real pleasure and honor to be here with such a great panelist and to talk about gender-based violence as a key issue to introduce in sensitive drug treatment, addiction treatment programs. So let me share a screen. I'll try my best for this. <laughs> Not easy. Can you see it well? We see you, but we don't. Ah, no, but not the presentation. Sorry. Okay. Okay. I can Perfect. see it. But you're not seeing the full screen presentation. I think you are seeing the notes presentation. Maybe. No, no, the full uh, kind of kind of full. Kind of full, but you see notes and full. Okay, that's tricky with so many screens, you know. Sorry. I think if you go back to the powerpoint yes and then pre-share the screen and then go back to zoom and when you're in zoom i think you can make it bigger sorry i know that time is running you have to put in the slide show mode
Okay, now we're good? Yes. Good, Perfect. sorry thank about you. that. <laughs> well, thank you very much again. Uh, first of all, I would like to introduce a little bit about uh, Dianova. Dianova is an international network. Our organization consists mainly of an international network of NGOs, associations and foundations operating in America, Europe, Asia and Africa. And we are fully dedicated to social change. In this slide, you can see pretty much a, a lot of different information about the Innova network, but um, I would like to highlight the gender parity in the composition of professional teams. We have 42 direct care facilities, that's more than 100 intervention and social reintegration programs and four awareness campaign. And related with awareness campaign, um, I would like to present you a video frame with the, the human empowerment campaign that we launched last 2019. Um, the campaign flagship video features a teenage girl who, because of negative experience, get lost in a spiral of addiction and violence. The video aims to highlight the specific problems faced with, pro with, with women and girls who use drugs. Um, well, I hope you like it and I hope I can share it. <laughs> Good. Otherwise, you can help me sharing this video, Victoria, or I'll turn my best again. Okay. Unique and formative time. Look at this girl who just turned 12. Her way through adolescence should be a unique and formative time. Yet, because of negative early life experiences, she's now exposed to very dangerous situations. Her life is spiraling out of control. She soon starts using alcohol and drugs as a coping mechanism. Now, what will her life be like? As a woman with substance use disorder, she's more likely to face gender-based violence. She'll be more exposed to early pregnancy and sexually transmitted diseases. She'll certainly be stigmatized for not fulfilling traditional gender roles. As a result, she will have little support to enter the treatment. Even if she does, she's more likely to drop out and fall off the wagon because most programs fail to address the needs of women. Let's go back and imagine she enrolls in a gender-specific program. She learns how to cope with daily challenges, receives valuable life skills, and with her life back on track, resumes her studies. She knows her value and self-worth. She takes care of herself. More than that, she's now ready to stand up for other women, helping them raise their voices and demand the services they are entitled to. Empower women, empower society. Okay. So I think you, you can see PowerPoint, but not just the full presentation again. Put in the slideshow, I think, down in the corner. Now, okay. Here. Here. Perfect. Great. So we are going to start by commenting some general concepts about what is gender sensitive, what is gender approach means and what exactly means in gender sensitive programs in addiction treatment. Then we will discuss a little bit about gender barriers in drug recovery. Uh, why do women enroll less? than men in addiction treatment programs and show worse uh, outcomes than men. And thirdly, we will talk about gender-based violence of drugs, that complex relationship in these two concepts. And last, um, how to build a gender-sensitive addiction treatment program. Some very practical tips, some of them, there is a lot of them, so we, we will talk a little bit about some. Um, the ABC keys to take into account from program design to daily practice. Well, um, a, uh, a gender sensitive approach should take into account the gender based difference when looking at any social phenomena, policy, or process. So, gender approach applied to the drug phenomenon, to the drug fields, means to consider particularities of gender, 
that impact in drug use, in drug abuse, and in recovery, and of course in social reintegration as well, and eliminate the base gender disadvantage to access and to remain in treatment programs or harm reductions or drug free, whatever the type of, of treatment. Um, talking about gender sensitive is more than male female binarism. Um, it means as well uh, other gender identities. Okay, we, we, we will not talk about this today, but I would like to highlight that when we talk about gender sensitive programs, it's more than talking about women or pregnant women. So according to the 2016 uh, World Drug Report, one out every three drug user was a woman, but only one out every five people in treatment was a woman. So there are specific gender barriers to sex access and remain in treatment, especially in inpatient treatment like therapeutic communities or hospital facilities, um, because there are specific gender barriers like being the primary care caregivers of children, um, like maybe because drug use takes place in the domestic environment and it leads to, you know, chronification of the drug use problem. Also, there is a, the, a, the huge barriers, I would say, is the double, the double stigmatization um, and the added social penalty experienced by women who use drugs. Well, what about the relation between violence and drug use? Um, regarding the relationship between drug use and violence, I would like to highlight the idea that women who use drugs do not receive violence because of their addiction they suffer violence because they are women and live in a, an equal system. I think it is a very important idea to remember. Um, the use of drugs can be a strategy for coping uh, with violence and in turn can reduce the ability to react to get out of this situation of, of violence. But according so with so many studies, um, it has been found that a higher prevalence of violence experience among women drug users than women in general populations, women drug users than men drug users, and a greater drug use among individuals who have experienced violence and trauma in comparison with others who has not. So what do we know about the link between violence suffered in women who use drugs and drug use? Well, there is an alarming, as I said before, there is an alarming prevalence of sexual violence and domestic violence. This to type of violence is more prevalent throughout their life. And the fact that treatment often do not have into account a uh, gender perspective or that their environments mostly frequented by men, men drug users, um, it makes that the specific needs of women are diluted. And it means that the experienced violence often is not addressed in, in treatment. Well, Putting the focus on violence faced by women who use drugs in addiction treatment program is a must because drug user women face multiple types of violence. It is crucial to detect and address the impacts that violence ha ha has had on them and their, their children as well. And violence and drugs generate, um, it is very important to understand how this violence to drugs is related to drug use and that it generates a very complex relationship. Well, I would like to mention uh, some key issues. There is a lot more, as I say at the beginning of the presentation, to take into account, but let's say this is the ABC to take into account to design a gender sensitive addiction treatment program, which will include mainstreaming the gender perspective and it means in all activities of our treatment program uh, and all people in our professional staff. I mean, it's not very useful when it's one, one single activity with a gender sensitive uh, and the other doesn't. So we, we need to take that into account. Also, we don't need big budgets and create new facilities. Is we, we need to be just open to rethink traditional treatment programs that already exist. Um, also, it's a very good thing to do to replicate good practices. There is a lot of good experiences that has been successful, and we can replicate that in our existing, our current programs. Um, in the fourth place, I would like to highlight 
and emphasize the specific training is needed in drug, gender, and violence, above all for those people who are, who are in, the, in the grassroots fields, directly talking and doing therapy with the drug user women. Um, also, it's very important to hold support groups of women, whether if a outpatient treatment or a residential treatment, hold support groups for women are a very, very useful place to address a lot of topics, very important topics that we cannot forget in, in therapy. And also, a less collaborative work between the different networks is essential to provide that comprehensive care like violence network, mental health, children's welfare. Okay. So, all that we have mentioned before increase the effectiveness and the good outcomes of treatment. But I think that violence against women and their children is a public health and a human right matter, and this should concern and involve everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gisela. Thank you so much for your insight and deep um, presentation about the relation between gender violence and, and drug use. Now I'd like to introduce you to our second speaker, Shoni Robbie of Odyssey House Louisiana. Shoni has nearly 15 years in health care experience with experience working in federal qualified health centers and behavioral health care and operating call centers, crisis centers, substance use disorder programs, and psychiatric hospitals. She graduated from the University of Southern Mississippi with a Bachelor of Science in Business Administration and a Master's Degree in Communication. Additionally, she holds a Master of Business Administration from Florida International University in Miami with a specialization in international business. In her role at Odyssey House Louisiana as Chief Operation Officer, Shoni oversees day-to-day -day operations of the agency's multiple programs. Shoni, you have the floor. Oh, thank you so much. I really appreciate this. I am going to attempt to share my screen um, and share my PowerPoint. Let's see. Are you able to see the presentation? Yes. Perfect. Thank you. All right. It's out of the way. Okay. Odyssey House Louisiana is a nonprofit behavioral health care provider with an emphasis on addiction treatment. And Odyssey House has a full system of care that includes prevention, detox, medical health care, and life saving skills. And we provide service to approximately 1,500 individuals per month. Odyssey House has a full continuum of care including medically supported detox, a 30-day residential treatment program, intensive outpatient with a housing option, and primary health care is offered to all of our clients. And uh, this also includes housing and case management services and outreach and prevention services. So as we know, violence and substance abuse are intimately linked together and they often occur simultaneously. And we also know that services address these issues, but often they operate in silos. And clearly racial and ethnic minorities experience these issues at significantly higher rates than non-minorities. And it's exacerbated by higher rates of poverty, lower education, and housing stability. To address these issues, Odyssey Health applied for and was awarded a SAMHSA grant called Targeted Capacity Expansion, HIV. We renamed the grant Omega, Odyssey House Minority Empowerment Group for Addiction. And the goals of this were to not to expand and enhance outreach to trauma-informed outpatient substance use treatment services to uh, minority women, but also provide HIV testing, as well as implement trauma-informed evidence-based intervention. And built into the programming was um, intensive outpatient and really a lot of women gender specific groups. And it was targeted uh, towards women to provide group therapy, individual counseling and case management. It helped women develop a lot of life skills 
and help access community resources and pursue education, for example. Many of the gender sensitive curriculums include the following. Sisters Informing Sisters on Topics About AIDS. There was a peer-led skill building intervention project with the overall goal to reduce sexually risky behavior for minority women and reduce the risk of HIV. And some of these sessions include the following. The next was Seeking Safety. It, developed, it was developed specifically for co-occurring PTSD and substance abuse. It focused on a lot of coping skills and addressed trauma in the present, unlike a lot of treatment approaches that we've seen that address it, uh, focus on the past. The next was a woman's path to recovery. This was a clinician-led program for women with substance use, and it took a very gender-based approach to help women recover from addictions of all types. And it was divided into two main sections. One was exploration, and the next focused on healing. There was economic success. It assisted women who often have a history of economic dependence on abusive partners, and it helped them gain the skills to effectively manage money issues and draw associations between their past substance use and their current economic situation. Helping women recover. This was an evidence-based program that integrated theories of women's psychological development, trauma, and addiction to meet the needs of women with addictive disorders. And there were modules that addressed those issues. So the results, the program was extremely successful, so much so that OHL was regranted a new award after the original three-year award sunset. Uh, although the seems to funding sunset, uh, we were able to continue to an, incorporate these gender-specific programs to um, our treatment module. And we were also awarded another five-year grant focusing on men. So I've talked um, quite a bit, and so I'd like for you to hear from some of the women who we serve. Sorry, sorry, just a second. I think we can we can't oh, it, listen to the video. Okay. Is the video not playing for you? We can watch it, but we can't listen to it. We cannot hear it. Okay. Um let me see if I can navigate this very quickly. Okay. Let's see. If I can navigate this quickly, I will. Otherwise, I'll move on. Is it full volume, maybe? Um, it is. Let's see. Um, let's see. Well, I think what I will do is I will I'll move forward. And because I'm unable to navigate the sound, but I'll give it one more minute to see if I can, um, if I can find something to navigate it. Did you mute yourself before? Maybe you don't have to. Um, no, I didn't. I didn't do that. But in the interest of time, 
No, no, um, no. You are, we are fine with time. Don't worry. Oh, okay. Sorry. Sorry. I say that yes. before you share screen, you have to click the two buttons in the lower right part of the screen that link the video to Zoom and optimize your video. That's okay. The solutions that they send. Thank you. Let's see here. Um, Okay, so in the lower right hand corner or lower left hand corner. Let's see if I can. Okay, well. I think what I'll do. Let's see. Did you? Did anyone? Did someone have a suggestion that you mentioned just now? Perhaps I can. Gisela said, "Can you repeat the instruction to or the indication?" Yes, it's the joint to run. Thank you very much. It's send instructions. She said, she said, before you share screen, click the two put buttons in the lower, sorry, left, right part of the screen that link the video to Zoom and optimize for your video. Okay, let's let me stop sharing. And I'm gonna mute myself for just one second. Okay, I'm trying this. Can you hear this? Yes. Yes. We are. Oh, yes. My substance abuse started in college, and I used all the way up until the time I graduated. And then when I came home, I got pregnant, and then I got married, and I stopped using. And once I had my son, I picked up just like that again. I, I suffer with diabetes and crack cocaine and diabetes doesn't mix at all. And on several occasions, I was in comas, um, 85 pounds and still using. In my first marriage, we became very abusive. Um, my self-esteem was nil. I depended on him for everything. The relationship was very, it was verbally abusive and physically abusive. I was actually very afraid of him. I would hate to come home from work. Actually, my son, both of us were afraid to come home. And when we saw his car in the driveway, we would just be like, oh, he's home. When the car wasn't in the driveway, we was like, yes, he's not. I started smoking weed, I would say, in high school. And then when I went to college, I went to San Diego State University, start hanging out with the older college people and they partied every weekend or partied every night. I was introduced to uh, powder cocaine. I moved from s snorting cocaine to um, smoking crack in weed. And then from there, I was introduced to the pipe and then I smoked crack in the pipe. One guy, I was the, his punching bag, you know, running, like got away from this guy, running down the apartment hallway, running down the street. Um, I did have a phone where I was able to call somebody and come pick me up. Um, but it was very scary because I never had dealt with anything like that before. Another instance, I had a another guy who would who was controlling and, you know, everything would be fine. And then he would snap. And another instance, I remember um, he was kind of choking me. He had me on the ground of my porch. I kind of looked over with my eye and it was one of those uh, cinder blocks, the concrete ones. And it was like this far from 
my head and I realized right then that I could die. I could have died right there in that moment if my head would have had to hit that. I think that it's really important in the treatment community overall that you take a holistic approach to working with women. I think importantly enough, you have to look at everything from uh, trauma, loss, also uh, the stigma associated with their family. And a lot of the women have had children and are separated from their children because of their addiction, which creates a whole different level of anxiety and depression and anger and resentment. So I think part of the thing is having curriculum and different tracks and to be able to focus on that, having women-specific groups and time where women can be alone with other women and to focus. Uh, the Omega program was uh, part of a SAMHSA grant that was awarded to uh, Odyssey House in, at the end of 2013. Some of the issues that are uh, women's face uh, or reported while in treatment are partner violence, uh, sexual abuse, low self-esteem, you know, just to name a few. The curriculums that we have in place address some of those issues. The gender-based programs are needed because it gives women the opportunity to uh, address issues that they um, normally would not be willing to or open to discuss in a, in a co-ed group. I think the Omega group would have helped me not minimize um, my trauma issues with the rape and with the violence um, and abuse that I had back in my addiction days. Um, I probably would have been able to focus deeper on that trauma um, and learn how to actually understand how it really had affected me, but at the end of the day, it's the same thing. I was violated. Omega helped me, it helped me to regain my self-confidence back. It helped me to um, reach out and not try to fix this on my own. For me, being in a quiet environment, some things I would share and some things I won't. When you're in an environment with just women, and women that have been through the same thing you have been, you have the tendency to want to share. Because you're listening to other people's story, and you're saying, damn, I went through that same thing. These women were, were strong women, and, and very educated, and, and able to help other women in, in the addiction process, and the abusive relationship process, and to let us know that it's, it's not your fault. It's not your fault. I've lost a lot of my addiction, but I feel like I'm in the process of rebuilding, doing things differently. Not getting back what I lost, but getting back a lot more. I have self-respect, I have self-esteem, I'm motivated, and all of that came from here. Honestly, I it did. It really did. Odyssey House Louisiana has been here for over 48 years and we're gonna be here a lot longer in the future. We're always here constantly changing, making adjustments so we can provide the best treatment possible for our clients. And that's exactly why we started this whole program around women and how to help women deal with trauma and violence as part of their recovery process. Because we knew from the work that we were doing that we weren't making the impact that we needed to make. Odyssey House Louisiana is here to provide treatment services. Visit our website, give us a call, and we're happy to help you. Odyssey House Louisiana, empowering people to conquer addiction. Okay. Are you able to see my, my next slide? Yes. Okay. So thank you so much for uh, your patience with that video. Um, and obviously there is a need for funding. Omega was a time sensitive grant and 
Um, there's always ways to incorporate a lot of these curriculums and we, and we do that, but it's very difficult um, when, there's, when there's not much funding available. And we know that women's programs are woefully underfunded and largely unavailable. And during this pandemic, um, it has increased risk for women um, and violence in the home. And um, so we expect to see these impacts last well after uh, the pandemic has, uh, has come to a close. And then finally, women are impacted by violence and substance use in a way that um, men may not be. And so a lot of these gender-based curriculums that we talked about are extremely helpful and clearly funding and support for these gender-specific services um, are needed um, to um, aid in, in this. So thank you so much for your time and patience with me. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you, Shoni. Thank you very much. Wow, what a powerful personal testimonies that are the power of the world, right? Thank you very much for bringing to us this, well, these experiences. Um, now I'd like to introduce to our third speaker, Jorgelina Di Giorgio of Intercambios Asociación Civil. Jorgelina is doctor in psychology and researcher at the National Council of Technology and Research in Argentina. She's a member of Intercambios Asociación Civil based in Argentina. Jorgelina is professor of social psychology at Buenos Aires University in Argentina, and she's author of multiple articles related to community social psychology mental health, human rights, and access to social and health services in key populations. Jorgelina is also a member of the Inter-American Society of Psychology. Jorgelina, please, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Victoria. I'm really glad to be here with you. Uh, I will share my presentation. Uh, so, I hope you can see it. Um, for those who, who maybe don't know, Intercambios uh, Asociación Civil is a civil society organization that has been working on potential harm uh, that drugs policy have on people who use drugs um, from the perspective of harm reduction. And for the conceptual purpose of this presentation, I will use Women, women to refer people who self-identify as such, regardless they are biological sex. But I want to, to explain this for you because we also work with transgender people, not only women who, who use drugs. In maybe I, I from a different point of the problems of drug use related with women, I will share with you first an overview of drug use in Latin America. Latin America drug control and treatment policies are still based on the general principles of eliminating the production, trade, or use of any illegal psycho psychoactive su substance. The war against drugs has led to more violence and human rights violations than maybe drug use. So I want to highlight the effects of drug policy on women, such as we saw in our programs in Argentina and the and in a work with other Latin American organization, um, and also to highlight how to provide positive support to women who use drugs from a harm reduction perspective. There are approximately 5.5 million people who use non-injected illegal drugs in Latin America, and the number of people who inject drugs is very low compared with other regions. The rate of use cocaine and its derivate, which are commonly non-injected, in the region is among the highest in the world. Precise data on the number of women who use drugs is really available because they fear disclosing drug use because of the risk of, of trauma and social sanctions. In Latin America, women approximately represent 20% of the people who use drugs. The smokable use of cocaine paste, it means an intermain product in the production of cocaine, also known as bazooko, pasta base, oxy, um, paco, is greater than other opioids in uh, South America. It's, cheaper alterna it's a cheaper alternative, and in general, women who use cocaine paste are, much, are apart from marginalized groups, 
are more stigmatized and face more stigma barriers to access to healthcare and health reduction programs than other women that use drugs. Harm reduction programs for non-injectable cocaine use uh, are placed in different countries in our region, also in Argentina. And although women experiences with drugs are really, really different from those that men have, have the services really take account this difference. Also due to the social crisis in the region caused by the COVID-19 pandemic, national government funding has decreased in many programs has reduce their coverage, and also women who use drugs are more affected. Increase, we recently did some research and we saw that increased violence, increase in domestic violence, barriers, barriers to drug treatment and health access, increase in police, um, in police violence, and also increase in economic hardship. There are, uh, we think that there are three types uh, in which women involved with drugs in Latin America um, we work with two, specifically with two of them, but I want to highlight or to show this because it's uh, a way in which uh, the drug problems affect women in our region. The third one is related to women's involvement in drug production. This is a problem in Latin America and also in the Caribbean because the production of cocaine and coca derivatives is prevalent in South America and women play in general an important role in coca cultivation because it's offered them uh, a chance to earn money. So we are talking about economic violence and structural violence for women that um, use this as a strategy to their sustenance. The second one is related with women involvement in drug trafficking. So women participation in drug trafficking has increased in recent years in Latin America. And also this is connected with structural violence against women. The main drivers for this increment include economic hardship, an absence of well-paid job opportunities, and their desire to provide adequate housing and education for their children. Uh, it's essential, I think, to distinguish between drug carriers, so low levels individuals uh, who usually transport drugs across the border uh, out of poverty or economic necessity, from drug traffickers, I mean individuals at higher level of the train chain who have both organizational and economic power and which allows them to make considerable treaties, a, a profit, sorry, out the trade of, drug, of the drug trade. So in general, women in our countries and also in Argentina are mostly involved as the low levels of, the, uh, of drug car carriers. Um, also, government, uh, local government recognize that in general, women use this as a strategy for sustains or economic, um, like an opportunity to, to economic, i sorry, <laughs> I can't find the word, sorry. <laughs> I mean that even local government recognize, recognize, recognize this, they will still persist in uh, punitive approaches and increasing police presence in the community and vulnerable, vulnerable places in our country. So uh, that means that in general, the number of women incarcerated of, for drug offenses is increasing in the region. And in general, they are more likely than men in the region to be convicted for nonviolent drug offenses, such as a small scale drug selling or for simple drug use. And we, we thought that this is one another um, drug related problem that affects spe specifically women and diversities in the, in the region. And the third one uh, is related that women's involvement in drug consumption. And we previously, the speakers talked a lot about uh, women who use drugs, but it should be known that the most women use drugs occasion, that, that use drugs occasionally and without any problems. I mean that we are a lot of women who use drugs without experiencing legal, social, and cultural health problems. And those that are more affected by drug-related harms and the negative consequences of drug are usually women that their uses is often impacted by class and race inequalities. 
However, it's necessary to point out that not all drug use is driven by poverty. Um, according to our work in our harm reduction programs here in Argentina, we can, we can char characterize uh, in some aspect women who use drugs, and this is something that we share with other women in the region, and also I think in other countries also, that they are more likely to provide sex, sex in exchange for housing, for protection, and for drugs. They are more likely to experience intimate partner violence, non-partner violence, and sexual exploitation. They are, high, they are at, uh, at higher risk of IHV and hepatitis C infection, especially for those who are sex work workers, and we are working a lot with unions of sex workers here in Argentina. Um, they face more barriers to access to healthcare and harm reduction programs than men. Also, if they are young women that use drugs, we notice that uh, they experience age-related vulnerabilities to access to the services, no? and even there are some legislation that allow them to go alone or by themselves to ask for information for drug treatment, also uh, sexual and reproduction, reproduction services in general. Um, um, the services don't um, attend, uh, don't assist them if they if they are not uh, with an adult, and this is a way of uh, a violation of the rights of adolescent and child. Um, are disproportionately affected by the removal of their children custody to access treatment. Sometimes they are involved with drug dealing, and this has a uh, a different way in which problems of drug, drug problems express in our countries. Not only they experience generalized, generalized social stigma, stigma, but they also, um, from health professionals, including those who are providing harm reduction services, and we think that this is a really huge pro problem related with the stigma, with social stigma for women that use drugs. And some of them are organized in movements, and this is important because there are many uh, civil society organizations that where women who use drugs are participating, and also mothers from people who use drugs. No, we have here uh, an organization called Madres, Mothers of Pasta Base, in Spanish means Madres del Paco, and they fight and they, they organize women in very poor condition communities to access to health for their child. And this is a very important activity in our country. Um, uh, excuse me. So we, some of the things I, I'm, I'm telling that the structural violence that results from patriarchal, patriarchal social norms, attitudes, and also as a capitalism made women who use drugs face double stigma based both their gender and their drugs. And experience an anticipated stigma can also lead women to extreme self estigmatization creating a sense of not being deserving of good health and therefore a lack of health seeking behavior. The experiences of stigma is particularly acute for women who use drugs and are pregnant or are parenting. There are a lot of myths and half truths and misinterpretation data around pregnancy and drug use. This prevents health professionals from engaging meaningfully with women who use drugs, disincentivizing them for having open conversation about drug use and can force women into riskier practices to conceal drug use and or pregnancy. So entrenched expectation of women are one of the major barriers to harm reduction services or treatment. So how to, prevent, to provide gender uh, sensitive harm reduction services for women who use drugs? It's clear that current drug policies are not only ineffective, but also have serious negative implication for women's health, social and economical situation, and can result in violation of human rights. In order to ensure that gender sensitive drug policies of harm reduction programs are adequately and desi designed and implemented, we think that is necessary. First, more research 
into the different ways are uh, women are involved in drug use or, or drug trade and the potential harm that current policies ca can have on them. We think that this is another way in which structural violence affect specifically on women. Training, we need also training programs to overcome stigma and discrimination against women who use drugs, especially among health services, because this prevents women to talk about their drug use and it is riskier for them. Women who use drugs should be involved in services to minimize the impact of the stigma. They have a lot of knowledge about their experience, about their drug use, and they know how to, to take care of themselves. So we need to include them with this uh, everyday life knowledge that sometimes professionals don't have. Uh, we need to ensure that women who use drugs can access to harm reduction services without fear of arrest of discrimination. It still persists that fear that uh, don't allow women to talk about their drug use. Um, HIV knowledge and a skill for negotiating safer drug use or sex practices among women, especially among young women and sex workers. We need to increase harm reduction provision in women's vision because incarceration, no? because our prisons are overcrowded because of uh, drug law, punitive drug laws. We need alternatives to incarceration or redirecting women charged with low level drug offenses rather to, um, to prisons. Also, we need to implement, you know, as we are working in Argentina, community-based prevention programs in their communities, not only to provide them health services, HIV and TB tests, also food services, hygiene services, and also legal advice for women who use drugs in our communities. We need to promote solidarity among women. And uh, we think that uh, women who are poor and also use drugs and, other, and also have other uh, stigmas, you know, like in an intersectional perspective, they are also more discriminated uh, than other women inside the, the uh, among women. No? We actually saw that with the recent case here in Argentina with a person with ho homelessness, a woman who is living on the streets and people are really uh, discriminate her and um, cul culpabila, cul sorry, I don't find the word, <laughs> but they, they are really, the treatment of the, their situation and their life experiences is really stigmatizing. And we also need to encourage women who use drugs to organize, to be part of the movements and to raise their voice for their rights. And of course, we need to decriminalize drug use in our region. So to close up in Latin America, uh, those most affected by the consequences of badly designed drug control policies are women who are also in poverty and social deprivation. Uh, sometimes this, as the previous speaker says, is connected with uh, dependent use, but I'm not talking about this kind of drug use. So as I said, many structural, cultural, and ideological factors make women particularly vulnerable to violence and also to health and social problems related with drug use. So raise your voice and promote the rights of women who use drugs. Thank you. Thank you very much to you, Jorgelina. Thank you very much. That's a very interesting presentation too, with many <clears throat> aspects to, to underscore. For example, the already underfunded programs and now even more because of COVID. So that's a really difficult situation. And that's because uh, that's why in Dianova, we've been uh, emphasizing the need of consider these addiction treatment service programs as essential service. They are essential and they need to be funded regardless of what's going on with other um, pandemics. Um, and I appreciate you and your presentation, Jorgelina, talking about the power of the civil society. And that is links to the next presentation to Nasli Maksudi of the NGO, New York NGO Committee on Drugs. Nasli is the chairperson of the executive committee of the New York NGO Committee on Drugs, a global committee 
that supports civil society engagement on drug policy at the United Nations and represents more than 100 organizations. Nasli has been involved in the development of evidence-based drug policies in 2013. Nasli is also the manager of the Policy Impact Unit at the Center of Drug Policy Evaluation and a PH candidate in Health Services Research at the Institute of Health Policy Management and Evaluation at the University of Toronto. Nasli, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for those that are attending today. Thank you especially to Dianova for this kind invitation to be part of the panel. It's such a pleasure to be here today. So as noted, my remarks are a little bit of a departure from what's been shared so far, but certainly complementary. My intention really is to highlight some of our working methods at the New York NGO Committee on Drugs, as well as discuss opportunities and challenges related to civil society access and participation. Moreover, my intention is really to stress the important role of civil society at the international level, and I will make some comments that are of particular relevance to the CSW, and I'll shine a light on some organizations that are members of the New York NGOC engaged in the important work, whether it be around drug-related incarceration, stigma, reducing harm for women, or other gender-related issues around drugs. So as mentioned, I am the chair of the executive committee for the New York NGO Committee on Drugs, and this is a global committee that aims to support civil society organizations in engaging with the UN system on international drug policy and practice, and it also facilitates the exchange of information between civil society and UN agencies, member states, other relevant UN bodies as well. We were established in 1984, and we operate under the umbrella of the Conference of NGOs in Consultative Relationship with the United Nations, or as many of you will know, the Congo. We also represent more than 100 civil society organizations from across the globe in our membership. I'm happy to share as well that we do have a long history of women at the helm of the New York NGOC. I myself follow in the footsteps of my predecessor, Heather Haas, who served as chair for six years and was absolutely central to our activities around recent high-level meetings at the UN on drug control. Heather also, she revived the New York NGOC after a period of dormancy, and she did so with the instrumental help of a prior chair, Rosalind Harris. And without her work as well, I could not be in this role today. So certainly tip my hat to the, the wonderful women that have come before me in this role. Now, a number of our members, as I noted, are really engaged in exploring and illuminating issues faced by women with respect to drug policies. And I'd like to just highlight a few of those today. So firstly, the Washington Office on Latin America and the International Drug Policy Consortium, they both devote a significant amount of their resources focusing on the human rights of women incarcerated for drug-related offenses in both Latin America and other parts of the world. Another organization worth flagging is the Women and Harm Reduction International Network, which works to improve the availability, quality, relevance, and accessibility of health, social, and legal services for women who use drugs. I also can't forget the National Advocates for Pregnant Women, which works to secure human and civil rights, health and welfare of all people, and focuses specifically on pregnant and parenting women, especially those that are from low-income backgrounds, women of color, and drug-using women. I'll also flag Mom Stop the Harm, which advocates to end substance use related stigma, harms and death on behalf of families and friends of loved ones affected by substance use. And some other organizations in this niche are Broken No More. They provide support and guidance to those who have lost a loved one to substance abuse. And Anyone's Child, which is an initiative of the Transform Drug Policy Foundation that also gives a voice to family members whose lives have been acutely affected by current drug laws and are now campaigning to change those laws. And of course, we can't forget Dianova, who have brought this event to you today and deserve our appreciation as they do some wonderful work in this area as well and are such a valued member of the New York NGOC. So really, our committee works to ensure that all have a voice in international policymaking and discussions at the UN around drugs. These organizations that I mentioned and others are really an important resource supporting member states, other UN agencies that formulate gender-related drug policies, both at the global and national levels. So having said that, I'll now share a little bit around the working methods that the New York NGOC has employed in recent years that have been quite successful. 
Those that work at the United Nations in the area of drugs will, will surely be familiar with the United Nations General Assembly special session on the world drug problem or the UNGAS that was held in 2016. And this really ushered in a period of collaboration between our committee and our sister committee, which is the Vienna NGO Committee on Drugs. Our two committees came together and partnered to form the Civil Society Task Force or the CSTF. And this was a global task force of NGOs that represented global regions, affected populations, global voices, and it was an effective vehicle for increasing the inclusion of civil society voices, both in the preparations and at the actual meeting of the UNGAS. And moreover, it was actively involved doing the same for the ministerial segment of the 62nd session of the Commission on Narcotic Drugs, which was held in 2019. Importantly, the CFTS was explicitly named in the Commission on Narcotic Drugs Resolution that outlined the modalities for that 2019 high-level meeting and thus really cemented its role in civil society inclusion in these systems. So some activities of the CSTF included, of course, identifying civil society speakers, both for the preparatory events and at the meetings themselves. And I'll flag here that diversity and representation were really of great importance in these selection processes. The CSTF aimed to ensure parity in representation of women and across regions. And in fact, we have guidelines for selecting speakers which explicitly include gender balance as a criterion to be considered in speaker se selection thus to ensure that representation. Some other activities of the CSTF included conducting consultations with civil society, which was done through online global surveys, as well as civil society hearings held in New York and Vienna. And we also published reports uh, that presented the findings of consultations that were done by the civil society task force. So the Civil Society Task Force is really was successful in delivering this range of actions in both 2016 and in 2019. And thus it's a useful example of cross committee collaboration in an effort to support inclusive civil society participation at high level UN meetings. Now in 2016, the, the global survey that we conducted, which showed really great global inclusivity and was quite well regarded by member states and UN agencies, it did highlight explicitly the impact of drug policies on women as a priority area for civil society for the young gas. And this, the same was seen in input from the consultations and hearings that were held with civil society. So I won't detail the, the types of, of impacts that were mentioned in terms of drugs and drug policy on women, but they certainly include those that were covered in today's presentations by my fellow panelists. And if this is of particular interest to you, I would certainly direct you towards just a great resource from civil society that compiles publications on the impacts of drug policy on women. And that is the virtual library on the Women and Harm Reduction International Network's website. And I will put a link in the chat afterwards after I speak if individuals are interested in checking out that resource, which I would encourage you to do. So thankfully, the UNGAS outcome document did actually reflect this priority of civil society, and it included a chapter on cross-cutting issues, namely drugs and human rights, youth, children, women, and communities. And that was truly a huge achievement that was advocated for by civil society. Moreover, the outcome document included directives to mainstream a gender perspective to ensure the involvement of women in all stages of developing, implementing, and monitoring drug policies and programs, as well as to develop and disseminate gender sensitive measures, particularly with regard to the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. So certainly some overlap between what has been shared by my panelists and some of the calls to action in the outcome document from the UNGAS meeting. Since then as well, we have seen the inclusion of gender in discussions at the Commission on Narcotic Drugs become more common. That's reflected in a couple CND resolutions with an explicit focus on women, as well as increased references to gender perspectives in resolutions at the CND on other topics. Not to forget, of course, the 2019 ministerial declaration, which itself did include a couple references to women and gender as well. So this growing emphasis on mainstreaming a gender perspective in international drug policy making really enables civil society to collaborate with UN agencies further on these issues and to encourage progress domestically as they can point to these advances internationally in their engagement and advocacy with governments at the national level to encourage that domestic change and really aim to bring the policy progress into action at the domestic level to have a material positive impact on the lives of, of women who use drugs and others affected by these issues. 
So having spoken a bit about the working methods and, and the relationship with gender and women there as well, I did want to say a bit about the opportunities and challenges that the New York NGOC has been facing in recent years. And of course, COVID-19 is front and center of mind. It's had several important implications for us, both positive and negative. So in terms of an opportunity, digitization really allows for the broadening and strengthening of meaningful civil society participation. We've removed the barriers to physical participation and that should serve as an opportunity for organizations and member states all to ensure that civil society access is at least as strong, but ideally stronger than it was prior to the pandemic and really should be leveraged to allow the inclusion of previously unheard from voices. So at the New York NGOC, we did see an opportunity to update our own working methods, giving the changes to UN working methods due to COVID-19 and the reliance now on virtual platforms for convenings and meetings, negotiations. So for the first time, the executive committee of our organization, we sought candidates for leadership, particularly the chair and vice chair for our recent elections that were not based in New York. And this was a first. It really reflects our efforts to address an issue that the NGO committee system focused on drugs is generally always ultimately governed from the global north. And that has been due to the physical location of the UN hubs and the importance of having someone on the ground in New York and Vienna. So while the New York NGO Committee on Drugs membership has been international since its beginning, a more global governance model will allow leadership to be shared with our partners outside these UN hub cities. And that includes myself, who is joining you from Canada. I'm based in Toronto. And our vice chair is from Costa Rica. So truly has allowed for inclusion and governance that otherwise had not been possible. But of course, there are risks as well. We know that the reformatting of spaces has meant the need to protect existing access. Spaces in some cases have been limited. So examples are allowing only pre-recorded statements by civil society or fully just restricting the number of attendees due to platform limitations. And such examples of restricting civil society engagement are, are troubling, especially because they're supported by some member states and can set a dangerous precedent for after the pandemic. So with respect to civil society access and participation at the CSW, these parallel events, though wonderful as part of the NGO forum, they of course are occurring on a separate and dedicated platform that's been coordinated by a civil society committee much like ours, namely the NGO CSW New York. These parallel events are taking place outside the formal framework and that can significantly limit the involvement of member states as well as UN agencies and, and thereby could consist largely of civil society talking amongst themselves. Now, of course, this division also existed when the NGO forum was held in person with many NGO representatives from around the world coming all the way to New York to attend the NGO forum, but not actually having access to the UN meeting. Another issue that pertains to the NGO forum that I'll flag, and certainly to other areas of civil society participation at the UN, I know myself it was really central around the UNGAS on drugs in 2016, is the inability for these parallel events to be considered or to influence the main outcome of the CSW, which is the agreed conclusions, given the language of that document is already agreed. And a final issue that I'll flag around the CSW is the lack of transparency around the selection of civil society speakers for both the general discussion and interventions from the floor during an interactive dialogue. So it's wonderful that NGOs with consultative status with ECOSOC have opportunities to address the CSW, but it's problematic that there is no information about who selects the speakers and what criteria that is based upon. So turning to the upcoming session of the Commission on Narcotic Drugs that, that it begins very soon on April 12th, we are actually still waiting on the modalities that concern civil society access and participation at this meeting. I will share in the chat afterwards a recent position statement issued by our sister committee, the Vienna NGO Committee on Drugs, which contains some urgent recommendations to protect civil society participation at the upcoming session of the CND and which the New York NGOC fully supports. And like the VNGO statement, I will note that the pandemic positively has seen really significant civil society collaboration in support of protecting civil society access and participation at the UN. 
that collaboration has also been across sectors. And there are examples, many examples that I can point to, but some are, of, of course, the activities of the Conference of Not Governmental Organizations in consultative relationship with the UN, so the Congo's activities, as well as the unmute civil society statement, the Foundation for Global Governance and Sustainability, and, and many others as well. So uh, to close my remarks, I will note that I believe that it's imperative to continue these good practices of consultation and collaboration in civil society organizing with this overarching goal of ensuring the continued and strengthened inclusion of diverse voices from civil society in UN proceedings. The UN as a whole has a responsibility to respect, protect, and promote the freedom to engage with the UN as an exercise of fundamental freedoms and human rights for all. We know that civil society represents a diverse range of expertise, perspectives, and lived experiences. So protecting and enhancing civil society access and participation at the UN is therefore just critical to the success of international policymaking. So I thank you all for your attention and I look forward to questions and comments. Thank you, Nasli. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, indeed, I think uh, at the UN with the organizations that work around the, the United Nations and with all the other representatives, we are amazed by the flexibility and adaptability that the NGOs organizations have shown with this pandemic and how we have rapidly interact and organize to bring our voices to the United, the United Nations. But as you said, there are many challenges. Sometimes we have spaces on paper, but when, when it comes to reality, they don't work. We don't have such, such spaces. And even though Antonio Guterres, the Secretary General of the United Nations, usually mentions that the UN needs the civil society, the UN needs the grassroots organizations. At the, at, at the end of the day, we don't have that open access. So we would like, us, thank you to Nasli to take this opportunity to make our voices heard. We want a true and open access to all the diverse civil society around the world. Thank you for your intervention, Nasli. Now I'd like to open the, up the space on the floor to the questions. From the audience, I have seen some of them posted on the chat. So please feel free to ask and to address the questions directly to the panelists if you want. Let me see. I have seen the first one from Pakistan. What policies are member states developing to involve inclusive policies to have gender sensitive addiction treatment programs? Any of the speakers? Inclusive policies from the member states. Nasli, do you want to take a try to the question? I know it's a difficult question. Sure, I'm happy to. I can speak a little bit about this from the perspective of Canada. Um, where I myself am based. So uh, certainly Canada has been at the international level since the UNGAS really championing the need for the mainstreaming of a gender perspective. So it is something that they are regularly flagging in negotiations around resolutions and really trying to make sure that that language is prominent across the types of outputs coming out of the Commission on Narcotic Drugs. I think one element that Canada has championed as well at the international level and aimed to replicate domestically in the policies and, and programs that they adopt and fund and support uh, in our country is around stigma. Um, folks that are involved at the CND may recall that Canada did champion and lead a, a resolution around stigma or stigmatizing attitudes against people who use drugs, which as my panelists have flagged is really critical when it comes to women who use drugs. There is this double discrimination and double stigma that are experienced. So it was really great to see Canada champion that. That was the first resolution ever around stigma at the international level at the Commission on Narcotic Drugs, rather on drugs. And that is something that Canada has aimed to bring to bear in their own domestic policies, funding various efforts around stigma, whether it be public education campaigns, programs that are targeting specific marginalized populations, including women, 
and the stigma that they face. There's certainly shortcomings. I really appreciated the calls for, for decriminalization. I think that criminalization is system, systemic stigma. And until the actual criminalization of the behavior is, is removed, the stigmatization of that behavior will remain. So uh, not to say that there isn't more Canada can do, surely there is, but they have aimed to replicate some of these policies at the international level around stigma and particularly around women in the different policies and programs that they fund and support. Um, so I think that's what I would share with respect to this question in my national perspective. Thank you, Natalie. Thank you very much. Um, I have another question to Shoni. Um, you mentioned that there is a difference between treating violence that is taking place in the present and violence that took place in the past. And we would like you to, to elaborate a little bit on that. Why is such a difference? Uh, I just think that in a lot of the programming and things that we have researched, at least here, um, a lot of the women who we worked with have expressed the fact that they, um, they have felt as though they have tried to work through problems from their childhood, work through problems from the past. But a lot of times what they, and, and that is very, very important. Um, but I think what we have found here, at least in the work that we do with the women here, is that focusing on the present, focusing on their future, how to move forward is one of the things that they have struggled with. And so in the programming that we've had here, we don't um, negate what has happened in their past, but I think that they're looking for a path forward. And, um, and so we have found that um, the most successful women in our program who've really gotten jobs and been able to really start a new life um, and to truly start over, um, work with the counselors and the case managers and all of the wraparound services that we are able to offer here, and that really helps them set, um, set them on a path um, that ensures success. Does that answer the question? Hopefully that answers the question. Thank you, Shoni. Of course, it's critical to provide a light at the end of the tunnel, right? Yes, to move forward. Thank you very much. I have another question regarding the uh, transgender and lesbian people, I think, Jorgelina, you can address that. What, what, the, what you're doing in these in drug treatment programs or, or also for homeless and in harm, harm reduction efforts? First of all, I must say that maybe as you know that the feminist agenda and movement in Argentina is too strong and also in Latin America. So we are um, working with LGTBII organization, uh, First, trying to know specific needs about uh, lesbian population and transgender population, because as I said previously, there are in general um, research or that data, there is no uh, specific that data on their needs. And also when we use, you know, we, we include um, in many programs in Argentina and also in Latin America, gender perspective and we reduce it to a specific need for a heterosexual cis woman. So first of all, we need to know more and actually we are enforcing gender perspective, um, including diversity, diversities, working with other civil society organizations, local civil society organization and also in the region. I think there is another question uh, from Coleta related with the uh, how women impact or by drug policies in Argentina and in Latin America. And I think that now we previously, it's not new for Argentina agenda and Latin America agenda, this uh, feminist or put together women to think about their issues or their problems. So we previously have um, meet each other in different conference on events and we uh, do it uh, intentionally to stay together in some uh, international events, for instance, the Latin American Conference on Drug Policy, also in national events where we try to discuss together about our no, thing, uh, issues related with women, transgender, and other diversities related with, with drugs. So we think this is a kind, a, a way in which we enforce gender's perspective and we try to impact in drug policies. Um, other one is that uh, we 
also have maybe in 2016, 2017 and 2018 different um, meetings with other um, harm reduction organization in Latin America. And we and actually currently we are working with trying to uh, build an anti prohibitionism and a feminist uh, network called Renfa. Uh, but now they work in Brazil and now they are trying to involve other uh, Latin American countries in that network. And in, a few, in the next days, we are going to have a meeting. So we are trying to build you know, a new ideas and to advocate for uh, women's rights. Um, I know, I, and, and I think and, and the other way in which we we try to impact impact policy, and I think this is um, that those who run programs in communities, like you no, know, like harm reduction services, not only intercambios but other uh, civil society organization and also governmental programs, uh, we run programs in the same communities, so it's easier for us to work together trying to enforce. Uh, uh, gender perspective in the programs and in other aspects of our lives. Thank you, Jorgelina. Indeed, Latin American women are very strong and Argentinian women are very strong too. And I know firsthand the power of connection and the power of network because planning this event, we had uh, two first former panelists that were sick and in a question of minutes, we have two panelists that step up <laughs> to make this event possible. So I know what the power of network at Connections are. Thank you, Georgelina. I had a question now for Gisela. I'd like to elaborate, you elaborate a little bit about what does it mean that drugs and violence generate a complex relation? Why complex? Why do you call a complex relation? Yes, um, because the well, the prevalence of violence suffered by women who use drugs is, is alarming. I mean, we, we, we have to highlight this, and this has a direct relationship with substance use, abuse, and how they recover from it. Um, we have to address medical, social, and personal issues in a holistic way with drug. Um, and as a result, we, we will have a gender-sensitive addiction treatment programs. It's a very complex dynamic and it's a very complex relationship, drug use and violence, because it's not just a linear relationship. This is sometimes a use of drugs, the results of a strategy to, to cope with the violence suffer, or sometimes the, the drug use begins first, which opens the door to, to other situations of structural violence that were about to occur. Um, the point is that sometimes it is difficult to establish what comes first, if drug use or violence, and sometimes not. And also, as time goes by, the increase in violence uh, throughout their life, the increase of violence, increased drug use, or vice versa. That's, I refer, that is a very complex situation because of that. There's uh, multiple scenarios, and we have to take into account this to, to address and to design better uh, treatments for each woman, which are all different. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Giselle. In fact, I was very impressed in one of the videos that Shoni showed about the, the women that um, it was normal for her being violated. So it, it's, uh, it's impressive how how it comes so naturally, right? When you are so used to, to be and to life around violence. And also for Shoni, I would like you to ask how a treatment is different or what do you have to take into, into consideration when you're treating um, Afro-American women in, this, in your program? What is the difference? What do you think are the, I don't know, historical barriers or cultural barriers that they, they oh. face? Um, well, I think um, culturally, some of the barriers have to do with seeking treatment, number one. So I think oftentimes in uh, minority communities, especially African-American communities, um, it, it's stigmatized. Like I believe uh, you have all, all mentioned in this panel as well. So getting past the stigma of just re receiving help and then um, admitting that there are, are problems. And then also uh, we have to consider some of the um, 
economic barriers that there are in place. Sometimes there's educational barriers and things that prevent people from getting the help that they need or even asking the right questions. Um, some of the experiences that minorities have, um, at least uh, perhaps in the US, uh, may be challenging as it relates to access to healthcare um, and in retention in that healthcare system. So um, what we've done is, uh, what we have found is that we, when we can focus on um, minority women, and we can focus on a lot of the other issues that are surrounding some of the challenges that they face, uh, we're able to get better outcomes that way. Thank you, Shoni. Um, stigma, I think it's present in every, not only in their daily lives, but also in our lives as civil society organizations. So I relate to a question on the chat box related on how can we improved the work of the different NGO committees around the United Nations? And also how can we bring into the CSW outdoor document or work, the importance of the women of who use drugs um, and the feminist agenda? I know that um, past years or two years ago, there was little, little mention of mental health, women's mental health in the CSW outcome. And I think the women using drugs are still a topic that is not included in the agenda. So, Nestle, what do you think that we, could, we can improve in, the, in that area? Thank you. Yes, this is just such an important question. And it really does apply, I think, across a variety of issues when it comes to drugs, that the UN is very siloed. It's this kind of area within the UN, the Commission on Narcotic Drugs, has quite a, the monopoly over these issues. And they do not, even though they're relevant, I think everyone on this, um, certainly the panelists, certainly the attendees would agree that it's a cross-cutting issue. Drugs and drug policy have implications across a variety of issues that are relevant to the United Nations. So it's containment to just one element of the CND is really a disservice uh, to all actors and, and to women, of course. So I think there, this event, of course, these types of collaborations really helpful. But I think something that I would point to, which perhaps allows an entryway, uh, whether it's in our advocacy with member states and UN agencies or something for us to point to, to show the need for this coherence across the whole UN system around drugs and particularly around its impact on women, is uh, embodied within the UN Chief Executives Board. So some may be familiar with this group. Um, it's chaired by the UN Secretary General and it rep represents 31 UN agencies. Uh, really the whole UN family is represented. And in 2019, they released a position statement on drug policy, um, which essentially was the first time the UN family was showing one common position around drugs. And they quite clearly in that document did outline the impact of drug use and drug policies on women. And in fact, they tied it back to the sustainable development goals, of course, and goal five around achieving gender equality and empowering all women and girls. So there are these mechanisms that exist in the UN. The SDGs is, of course, another one, but that highlight kind of the, the intersectionality, the applicability of these issues across the UN system. So I think it really is in our you know, collective benefit in our mandate as civil society to continue to push for greater alignment, greater coherence across the UN, and the taking up of these issues around drugs in forums other than the Commission on Narcotic Drugs. So I know certainly at New York NGOC, that is a priority for us. We have, in fact, hosted some events around the common position, around the chief executives board to try to highlight the importance of this initiative and, and encourage it to continue. And that's something we will continue to do into the future. But I certainly think it's an important priority and it speaks to the shortcomings of how this issue is currently being addressed within the UN system. Thank you, Nestle. I have another I have another question for Shoni uh, regarding the funds you receive uh, from, from the state, from the federal state. Do you think a difference when it changes regarding the administration? I mean, it's different when we have a Republican administration on power and then we have when we change to a democratic administration? Sure. Um, there's, there is absolutely a 
there, there can be a difference, but it really just depends on what the priorities are. And I would say in general, um, regardless of which administration is in, in office, um, substance use disorders, um, they are not always at the top of the list of things to address. So I think that regardless of that, I think that's something we, we as a community need to help overcome in general. Um, we just have to continue to make our voices heard uh, regardless um, because we struggle and we really do um, advocate all the time. Um, and I think the rest of you all can agree that it's, it's very, very challenging um, in any political environment to get the funding that we need, to get the support that we need to do and carry on the work that we wanna carry on. And like we mentioned, um, like I mentioned in the presentation, um, although that the, the SAMHSA grant that we had sunset, we still tried to find a way to incorporate some of that funding. And I know that a lot of organizations are doing the same thing, that they're just digging deep to try to find a way to keep those services going because they know that they're vital and necessary. Thank you, Shoni. Indeed, we dig, we dig, but we don't find <laughs> much resources. I have another question for Gisela. Um, we've mentioned that many women feel more comfortable in, in programs only focus on women. But I'd like to ask you, what if we introduce a gender sensitive programs with men? What happens? Is it necessary? It works? How do you, how do you see this? Sorry, the microphone. Yeah, um, well, definitely it's essential that programs take into account gender perspective, not only for, for women. Treatment programs is a uh, mixed treatment programs and only male programs because um, the gender perspective uh, is useful to address how, how the mandate of masculinity and femininity are related to the drug use. And, and how they relapse and how they recover and how they, you know, their social reintegrations. Um, treatment is a unique opportunity to dismantle the hegemonic masculinity model and work on new masculinity and how to deal with emotions and how to deal with relationship um, without drug use, uh, without this you know, toxic mandate of masculinity. So yeah, we definitely need to introduce gender gender perspective when we 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 work with men as well. Yeah, it's a must too. Thank you, Gisela. It's a must. That's something to remember. Totally. Um, Georgialina, I'd like to one of in your presentation, one of the aspects that drew my attention is that you said that um, drugs were not related to poverty in women. So I'd like to ask you why in Latin America, why it happens that? I think I said that not only is related with poverty. So I try to say, trying to reduce double stigmatization for those who are poor and also use drugs. Uh, actually in Argentina is a recent uh, case about a woman who is homelessness also he used drugs and his child was kidnapped by a person and all movement not related with he was uh, stigmatized and culpabilized because of her drug use and the problem one of the problem not the problem is that some women also use drugs but we have better conditions and uh, policies and drug policies don't affect us as the same as vulnerability or poor uh, women or transgender people. So what I'm trying to say that is important to include race, class, gender, sexuality perspective when we talk about drug use and also to promote solidarity among women because also women reproduce a stigma with other women that use drugs and are poor, no? Uh, especially related with motherhood and how to take care of children. No, this is another problem. Uh, in general, we, of course, those who work with drug treatment and also those who, like us, that work with harm reduction services, we know that sometimes drug problems affect motherhood and we can uh, establish a necessity connection 
between uh, the ability of care of, of care their children and drug use. And I think this is same, the same with poverty. In general, public policies, not only drug policies, pay more attention to those who are poor, that live in, in different, and very that, that they struggle in their life in their life with different kind of things and drug problems, and also gender violence is across class classes. So I think that that was I tried to say. I don't know if I answer your. Um, I did. You did. You did answer. Many of us, no, many of us also use drugs, like recreational use of drugs, and also we we could have some problems, legal problems, also health problems and social problems, but not at the same. No, it's not the same. We are not the same woman, and we need to deconstruct our privileges of gender, of race. No, like white women, uh, this uh, aspect that we think we need to deconstruct also when we talk about gender perspective and drug use. In fact, we, we, we would like to push for uh, unblinded policies that take into account the different environments and circumstances of the, of the women. And also when we talk about policies, we need to stress the, the need of disaggregated data between race, gender, um, whatever. I mean, as much as disaggregated as possible, to make our policies tackle the right, the right problem. I have another question for Naslim, that you pointed out the issue of systematic stigmatization. Should language be prioritized to address and tackle this issue among organizations, media, and public in general? I think this is a very important question about what language we are using. Yes, that's a critical question. And of course, the language that we use can either further stigma or address stigma. And I think it's on us as civil society to make sure that we are using the language that is most appropriate, that is uh, considered least stigmatizing. And my understanding is that is, of course, people first language. So always using terms like women who use drugs, as opposed to uh, drug using women, putting the, the person ahead of the activity. And that type of language is really something as well, again, turning to Canada, that they have been championing as part of their anti-stigmatization efforts. So whether that's updating all the national drug policy documentation to use people first language, as well as the various education campaigns they do, trying to make sure that that language is consistent across the various outputs. I think that's a really, really great start. Um, without doing that, you know, you, you're dehumanizing people, you're not understanding the, the full scope of their humanhood. And that is is absolutely essential. It's certainly not where we stop when it comes to addressing stigma, but it's a really excellent place to start. And, and certainly there are many countries in which that hasn't happened yet. So we can, as civil society, continue to push for the use of non-stigmatizing language at the national level. And media was also mentioned in the question. I think given that media is really a key place where individuals that may not be familiar with these issues get information on these issues. It's really on us to also, as civil society, be doing our absolute best to be educating media, whether we have colleagues that work across various media platforms. I know there have been a number of good materials produced by drug policy organizations that are really guidelines for how media should be talking about these issues, language they should and shouldn't be using. Um, so I think it, it is uh, absolutely essential that ourselves and, and those that we work with, whether it be government or media, are empowered and given the right tools to be using that language that is minimally stigmatizing and can address stigma at that level. Thank you, Nasli. This is food for thought and homework for everyone to keep up an eye on the language. And now before closing, thank you very much for your questions for the, for the audience. But before the closing, I'd like to ask the panelists to take one minute and give us a message, um, a main takeaway, what we would like to, to sleep on tonight. Um, starting with Gisela, please. Mark, yeah, first of all, thanks again for inviting me. It has been very inspiring and so nice to share with you this time. Uh, well, first of all, um, highlight again how important is the specific training for grassroots professional teams about gender, uh, drug use, and violence. That's super important. Um, 
Secondly, and as important as the first thing, is to be open to rethink our traditional treatment programs, to change them and improve them. We can do better things. A lot of best practices are being done, are being done right now. So we need to be open to, to change, to give better services for them. Thank you. Please. I'm okay, Shoni. Thank you very much, Gisela. Shoni, this is your turn. Okay, thank you so much. Um, and what I'll, what I will close with is that um, funding. I'll just focus on funding. There needs to be funding available to do the work that we all need to do. Um, in my presentation, that you saw two women, one who was able to benefit from programming and the other who, who was not able to benefit from the program because it just, she came about too late. Um, but I think we all need to have even greater levels of advocacy and greater levels of funding. And that's the only way we're going to push through this. And, and we do someone, uh, we need to help reduce the stigma and um, focusing on, I think you mentioned declassification, of, of groups and that is extremely important. And we do need to focus on um, the groups who absolutely need the help um, and really focus on not only women, um, but uh, minority women in general, as you can see, are affected by a lot of different um, factors that maybe are, are very more specific to them. So I just would like to close with that, um, that advocacy and funding are extremely vital in, to continue the work that we're doing. Thank you very much, Shani. Thank you, um, indeed. Um, Georgelina, what is your main takeaway? Okay, thank you again for the invitation and this inspiring uh, moment and meet. Um, I, I was thinking in two things. The, the first one is if we change our way to see those who use drugs, their reality will change. So it's important to change our ways of thinking and comprehension on this problem. And the other one is that complex problems like uh, drugs uh, related problem to women uh, needs uh, a variety of response. So try to be creative and innovate in our responses to think in these problems. Thank you, Georgelina. In fact, innovation and creativity is needed everywhere in every day of our lives. Nasli, your turn. Thank you. Thank you. And my thanks as well for this great event. It's been really inspiring and great to see the attendees with so many questions, such a dynamic discussion, really a pleasure to be a part of. I think my couple points that I would, would leave for food for thought and linking back to some of the concepts that have been discussed, the point that came up in the question and answer around the lack of kind of coordination across the UN system on these issues is really, really important. And I think that we can also consider that in our own work as civil society, we can be siloed as well sometimes and be working just in our own kind of niches. And this event, of course, is a really great example of collaboration across maybe committees or sectors that wouldn't always be speaking to one another. So I think it's on us as civil society to replicate or, or demonstrate rather the ways that we can have this cross committee collaboration, cross issue collaboration, this coherence across the civil society sector. If we're asking for that to be replicated within the UN system, we certainly need to be demonstrating that and being a leading force on that. So I think this event is a great example. Other activities like this are certainly worth pursuing. And COVID-19 does present opportunities. It presents challenges too, but it remains on us to leverage those opportunities and be vigilant about the barriers, push back against the barriers as much as we can to make sure that we're not losing space within this pandemic that will be difficult to regain afterwards. So uh, a word of caution there that I'm sure is front of mind for everyone in this space, but certainly something for us to remain vigilant about. Thank you, Nasli. Wow, it's impressive, right? That's a very, thank you speakers. Thank you to all of you for your expertise and knowledge sharing. It's been a captivating event. I'm really, wow, so inspired and there is a lot of food for thought. And before closing the session, I'd like to apologize for the technical inconvenience we have suffered. 
the platform Pathable, it was new for everyone. So we, we've learned as we did. So apologies for these um, minor mistakes. And again, I'd like to express my gratitude to the NGO CSW Committee of New York to make this virtual forum happen to the speakers for their everyday work and the time and dedication they have put to this particular event. To my colleagues in Dianova for the amazing behind the scenes support and good energy always. And last but not least to our audience, thank you very much for being here with us today, for choosing our event and for making this event so interactive and dynamic. And thank you very much. Bye bye to all. <laughs>